Welcome to our fortnightly AFAN uh, video presentation. My name is Paul Geisel and like um, uh, Craig and Ian McPherson, uh, we're co-founders of AFAN. And uh, as uh, Craig and Ian are the same, we also have a business on the side and uh, my business is in aged care. So we've got a very special guest this morning, but before I introduce Adrian, I'd just like to recap on uh, our presentation two weeks ago. And we were very uh, fortunate to have Commander Glenn Harrop join us. And, and Glenn's a, a fiery and he's based in the eastern suburbs of Victoria. So went through, he shared all his experiences through that dreadful uh, time with the bushfires down there not so long ago. And uh, he, was, he very kindly shared with us that he had a stressful time following those, uh, those bushfires. And he had to seek both uh, professional and personal help. One of the people who helped him the most was one of his friends and that friend happened to be his wife and it was just nice of him to let us know his story and I know that there'd be some people out there at the moment in, in the industry that we're in that would be hurting and uh, all I would say to you you're not alone Glenn's story was a wonderful story and uh, he came through the other end as you can and uh, my advice to you would be you know, if you're doing it a bit tough talk to your mates in terms of uh, doing things tough, our, uh, our next guest speaker, I'm both privileged and, uh, and very happy to introduce, is Lieutenant Colonel Adrian Trappett. And uh, before I get Adrian to say a few words, I'll uh, say Lieutenant Colonel Adrian Trappett enlisted in the Army as a soldier in 1993. He did some uh, training in artillery and signals, subsequently undertook officer training in the Royal Military College, Duntroon, graduating in June 1998. Adrian was fortunate enough to uh, have a number of postings overseas. He, he was deployed to East Timor twice in 1999 as part of the Interfet, and in 2006 in Operation Astute. He deployed to Kandahar, Afghanistan in 2009 as the officer commanding the Afghanistan Signal Squadron of the Force Communications Unit 2. And most recently, he deployed back to the Middle East region as the commanding officer of the Theatre Communications Group. So he was based there in the Middle East at Camp Baird. And uh, as Adrian, uh, when we were talking the other day, reminded me, uh, Camp Baird is, is named after the last recipient of a, a VC, and that was Corp Cameron Baird. He was a commando, a warrior in the true sense of the word. Unfortunately for um, Corporal Baird, the, um, the VC was awarded posthumously. But the other part of what Adrian has done, and I, I really like this part, in 2016, he was appointed as a senior military communications officer at the Embassy of Australia in Washington, DC, spending three years in the United States. He is currently working as a communications planning officer at headquarters Joint Operations Command in Canberra. So very impressive, uh, Adrian. And just there's three other things that I'd like to raise before I uh, talk to Adrian and ask Adrian some questions. And the first thing is Adrian uh, made it a point to me to make sure I was saying that he will talk about the military and not for the military. And again, one of the reasons why he's in uh, city clothes today, and I totally understand that. The other thing that I'd like to add is on a personal note, Adrian's a senior serving military officer, officer a Lieutenant Colonel. I am going to refer to him as Adrian throughout this presentation or mate. And the reason why I do that is because I have known Adrian and his family pretty well all his life. His parents were particularly good mates of ours and also knew his grandparents. So to call Adrian anything else but Adrian or mate would just would not seem right. So it's not disrespectful, it's just uh, the way it is. Now what I'd like to do is, is go back to Arlington. Uh, what were you doing at Arlington? Uh, hobnobbing with Australian royalty, if you'd just like to talk us through that, please. Uh, yeah, hey, uh, Paul, thanks very much for having me today. It's a, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to have a chat and share my story. Uh, so, look, Arlington, uh, as you said before, I, uh, I, I spent uh, three years in, in the United States and uh, that photo was taken in my final year when the, uh, the Prime Minister uh, at the time, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, came across with Mrs Turnbull. Uh, and we, uh, we, we uh, went over to, um, uh, travelled over to Arlington Cemetery, uh, where we uh, laid a wreath, as you can see, at the, uh, the grave site of uh, one of two Australians that are currently, uh, or that are buried at Arlington Cemetery. Uh, it was a flying officer, Francis Milne. Uh, so Francis was a, uh, 
uh, was a crew member on a uh, on a, uh, a shared coalition crewed aircraft. He was with Americans, uh, which uh, which crashed uh, on uh, left on a mission on the twenty sixth of November, uh, nineteen forty two, and crashed in New Guinea. Uh, wow. Francis uh, Francis's remains were uh, were subsequently found in nineteen eighty nine. Uh, and uh, because of the uh, the nature of the crash, um, uh, they, they, they couldn't obviously separate uh, Francis from the uh, from the other crew members, and uh, so so Francis uh, was uh, was was interred at uh, Arlington Cemetery as one of two Australians. The uh, the second Australian, forgive me, I uh, I, I don't have a name, but uh, uh, was a Red Cross worker who was uh, was killed in uh, uh, one of the nine eleven attacks uh, as well, um, and she okay. uh, was also uh, buried at Arlington Cemetery. Yeah, no, a wonderful photo, that one, mate. Um, so let's go back to 1993. And uh, so my first question would be, uh, why did you take on the military as a career? Yeah, that's a great question. I, uh, um, so so it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful when you have the opportunity to actually reflect on these sorts of questions. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, the, fir the first thing that uh, it, it led me to uh, actually think about was how long I've been in the military. And uh, it's a, uh, when, I, when I clocked it up, it's, uh, it's 27 years, uh, which is mm. a... Uh, uh, a long time in one profession, but uh, but uh, as as we talk, I, I, I dare say I'll share the uh, uh, whilst it's a long time to be in the uh, the single organisation. I've done many jobs, uh, seventeen different postings. Um, so that's a uh, that that's been a a great opportunity. Uh, and as you said, uh, deployed four times. Um, so so why did I join? Uh, I uh, yeah I, I've been exposed uh, to the military. Uh, uh, or up up to that point throughout uh, throughout my life, uh, Dad uh, was in the military as a uh, as an officer. Um, so you know, being exposed at an early age, I'd always had a bit of a taste for uh, uh, for, for what the military life might offer. Um, and I can still remember you you'd see Dad coming home from work in his uh, in his uniform, and uh, and that that was pretty impressive. Um, yeah. we, we, we moved around a lot. Uh, again, reflection. Uh, I think I counted uh, up to around about uh, seven schools throughout my schooling uh, uh, that, that, I, that I did attend uh, throughout uh, a number of states. But, uh, you know, it's something I became very comfortable with. And uh, I uh, joined Army Cadets uh, when, I, when I had the opportunity at school. And that, uh, that sort of started the journey uh, for me. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, it was a. Uh, it, it was for me. It was a, a natural progression and something I've enjoyed thoroughly. Yeah, mate, and I think it even goes back a bit further than that. Uh, at least one of your granddads, if not two of them, also served in World War Two. I understand. Absolutely, yeah. So, so both uh, both my uh, grandparents uh, on uh, mum and dad's side, uh, they, they they both served, and a great grandfather that served in uh, in, uh, in in World War One as well. So, you know, there there is a uh, a. Uh, a history or a tradition uh, within the family that uh, that um, we, we we do find ourselves in the service, uh, and yes. I'm uh, I, 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 you know, uh, it, it's not platitudes. I, I am very proud to have uh, to also have uh, continued on that tradition. As we are, but the main functions of your role at the moment, just so that the people uh, listening can sort of understand what you do without giving any secrets away, obviously. Uh, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So, so look, I, I guess. What what I'd uh, I'll I'll start back and sort of just explain to you sort of what I've done and then uh, and uh, and into the current day. Uh, so so joined the army through the Ready Reserve scheme. If anyone uh, happens to remember back that far, uh, 1993 was uh, was uh, it was the it was the main recruiting method at the time. Uh, I, I joined as a as a gunner uh, as uh, as Paul said earlier, uh, and uh, I uh, I spent um, uh, a year. Basically, uh, you know, through through training, uh, through initial training in Wagga Wagga, and then uh, moving on to my, uh, uh, my my employment training, which was up at North Head in Manly in Sydney, which was a a, a very tough gig to take for uh, for three months um, uh, while I, while I stayed up there in Manly. Um, allocated to artillery, um, stayed uh, managed to move back up to Brisbane uh, near Mum and Dad, but. Uh, um, and I was employed as an artillery signaller. Um, so, so, and as an artillery signaller, you, you can expect two jobs. Uh, one's either down at the command post uh, on the gun line, uh, or humping a, uh, a rather large heavy pack uh, as you uh, as you traipse up uh, mountains. And obviously, uh, forward observers supporting the forward observer uh, who calls in the fire. And uh, and uh, naturally, they need to be at the highest point possible, um, or they made it a point to be on the highest point possible. Mm -hmm. Um, so often that uh, included uh, uh, carrying some uh, reasonably heavy packs uh, up and down. 
Um, yeah. I, was, so I, I was just going to say, I was, I was very fortunate during my time as a, uh, as a, as a gunner uh, to have, uh, I, there was a point at which I, uh, I was posted to Sydney. Um, I, uh, I had a sergeant there who, uh, who um, uh, I, I'm not sure whether he recognised uh, any potential per se, but uh, he certainly uh, pointed me in the right direction uh, and suggested I might consider selection for uh, uh, or officer selection. And uh, he helped me with that process, and uh, and it sort of leads me to where I am, uh, where I am today. Um, I, uh, I I so 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 right now I'm a uh, I'm, I'm a communications officer uh, within the military. Uh, I uh, the the Royal Australian Corps of Signals. Um, I uh, I did join that. Uh, so so when you go to RMC, you have the opportunity to uh, uh, to to select a corps. Uh, and uh, thinking about my selection was a uh, uh, it was interesting because there were a number of different options there. But I, I wanted to move into something that was technical. Uh, and uh, and uh, I had uh, some some great uh, uh, someone who had some great experience in that uh, particular field. Uh, in that uh, dad was a uh, was also a communications officer within the army as well. So I uh, so uh, having a chat to him, uh, one of the things he encouraged me to do was perhaps uh, consider a uh, consider a uh, a job in the military that might also have a, a civilian application. Uh, because sense. you just never know. You, you, ne- you never know when your when your last day in the military might be. Yes. Um, and uh, and uh, just to have a uh, have a have a plan B. So uh, I uh, I went into the Royal Australian Corps of Signals and uh, and uh, again I've seen the corps come through a, uh, a a really interesting change over the years. As as, as you would all appreciate, um, technology uh, changes every single day, and uh, yep. and uh, trying trying to chase that uh, uh, trying to chase that technology and uh, and uh, and keep up to pace with uh, how how we provide communications is a, uh, is, is amazing. So just on that uh, point, Adrian, you had uh, two uh, deployments to East Timor, but the first one to the Middle East, I think at that stage you were a major uh, and doing a similar role. So part of what this um, presentation is about is planning for the known and the unknown. So a normal day in that role in your first deployment to the Middle East, what would you do um, on, on a regular basis? And then how do you plan for the unknown, I mean, uh, there's, there's two questions there, obviously. Um, I mean, the enemy to me uh, could be a, a person in a different uniform coming over the wall or, or, or incoming something. But to you, in your role, it might be something different. And uh, so in, in your first uh, deployment in the Middle East, what did a normal day look like? And then how did you prepare for things, you unknown things that could possibly happen? So, so uh, 2009, I deployed to uh, uh, the Middle East. Uh, in my, that was my first deployment to the Middle East. Uh, I was a squadron commander, uh, and uh, I took approximately uh, about uh, 80, uh, 80 personnel in my squadron. So we, we were part of the force communications unit, uh, the second rotation uh, into, into the theatre. Uh, and uh, my responsibility was looking after the, uh, the, the communications that were deployed in, uh, in, in Afghanistan. Because uh, 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 Australia had a rather large footprint uh, in that neck of the woods at that time. Um, obviously, your uh, uh, you, you, your daily your daily duties uh, will, will depend on uh, your rank. Uh, because again, uh, as I, as I led the uh, the, the squadron, um, I uh, you know, on, on a daily basis I was responsible for uh, the I guess the communications planning. Um, so making sure that uh, that things were uh, going as they should be. Um, and managing the uh, the uh, soldiers uh, that I had at that uh, that particular point in time, making sure that they could do their jobs. Mm. Um, I guess you know the key aspect of my job uh, as a communicator is to provide my commander uh, communications, so they are able to talk to their uh, next higher headquarters. And we do that through a uh, through a number of different means. Um, so within our within our core, um, I have uh, a number of we've got uh, four no, five different trades now. So we've got uh, radio operators. We've got technicians. Uh, we've got information systems op- operators. Um, so it's looking after your ICT. Uh, we've also got electronic warfare specialists and uh, a very newly created uh, cyber um, trade as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so uh, obviously, as a, as as the uh, as the squadron commander, you uh, you're assigned your mission, uh, and uh, you, you you need to get out and uh, have a look at. Uh, uh, how you're going to achieve that? And you might use uh, one of those uh, those particular trades to carry out your mission because uh, you, our communication suites are scalable. 
um, or you might uh, you might use all five trades um, mm-hmm. to to be able to uh, get after your mission. Um, so for us, it was about uh, at that time it was about communications planning, uh, making sure that uh, things uh, were, were going as they should be, and my commander could communicate uh, because Afghanistan wasn't the only place we were located uh, within the Middle East. Uh, so it was important that we had the ability to uh, um, uh, we had the ability to actually uh, provide communications right around the Middle East as well, and that was done, as I said, uh, as part of a wider uh, force mm. communication unit. Well, um, Adrian, could could you lose your communications? Could you could you be blind? Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so you talked earlier about uh, about uh, the enemy, uh, and uh, as a communicator, you've got. Uh, uh, you've got a number of different threats, which uh, ranges from obviously uh, uh, the uh, the enemy that may make it through uh, your, the, the the defences and damage your uh, your communications, um, or right right through to uh, just weather effects. Uh, mm. So uh, you know, things things like heavy cloud cover, rain showers, uh, heavy sandstorms, and those sorts of things uh, play havoc with uh, certain types of communications. So yeah, so so on a daily basis, it was uh, was trying to make sure that. Uh, you, uh, you, you know, it's uh, you, you, uh, obviously with the weather forecasters, you'd uh, you'd be able to plan for some of those things and uh, use yeah. alternative means. But uh, but uh, for the most part, it's it's about uh, you know winning winning the fight, uh, so to speak, with uh, with the uh, with the communications. Yes, and and I understand that um, <clears throat> when you were over there the first time, uh, I think it was um, June around about that time, and one of the, one of your most important roles, uh, as I recall was to make sure that the troops could watch State of Origin. Yeah, absolutely. It's, a, uh, it's, 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 it's incredible to see the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the importance of, uh, and again, so, so my, my role is to provide uh, uh, secure communications for the commander. But, uh, gee, I tell you, uh, if uh, I, I, was, uh, I, I was threatened on a daily basis that uh, if the State of Origin did not work, uh, then there was going to be uh, <laughs> going to be trouble, um, and uh, fortunately, uh, we, uh, we we managed to. Uh, if if it, if it took me holding uh, two pieces of wire together in my mouth, I was I, I was I was prepared to do that. It's a uh, committed uh, to a role. Like, like to see it, a true Queenslander. So, Adrian, the, the role that you have and the people you command, there'd be a lot of stress, I, I uh, presume. And so, how do you manage? Again, I'm asking two questions, but. How do you manage your own stress? And I guess as a senior officer, you'd have to control that fairly, um, fairly well. And then what do you do or what does the military do to help uh, your troops um, you know, control their stresses and, and anxieties and whatever? Yeah, I, uh, that, that's, a, that's a great question as well. So I, I guess uh, I, I just I just pop back to uh, your previous question as I laid into that. The um, uh, we, we talked about planning for the unknown, uh, and one of the things we do in the military uh, is we, we, we have what we call the military appreciation process, uh, and that's a that's a that's a uh, it's it's a way in which we plan, and uh, and and that planning can range from a a very quick assessment of a situation uh, in order to work out what your options are, and uh, and uh, and sometimes that's quite easy. And uh, one of those things you might find uh, is again an example I would use is a. Uh, is, is, is if troops were in a, uh, in, in a in a contact in a firefight, um, that's where you would uh, you would not like to take too long to uh, to decide what you're going to do. Um, mm-hmm. you, you, you weigh up your options and you and you and you uh, and, and then you get after what what appears to be the best options. Uh, and then that also ranges right through to what we call deliberate planning, which uh, which um, you know can take uh, a number of days, uh, where we uh, we work uh, through very uh, detailed courses of action. Uh, and that's uh, that's important as well, and that's where we have a little bit of lead time as we're going into a particular uh, uh, area, uh, and uh, and we really want to work out what our best options are. Um, from there, uh, what what we what we do is uh, with the courses of action. You've also got what we call actions on or uh, or contingency plans, uh, and uh, as you know, you cannot plan for everything, uh, but uh, but you can certainly uh, plan for what uh, what what you think are most going to be the most likely mm. outcomes. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, and then have a plan as to how to address those. Uh, and, and I guess the uh, you know the, the good thing about the military is that uh, we, uh, we 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 train a lot, uh, and, uh, and and we uh, we've got very highly skilled people and professional people. Um, we encourage innovation, so you uh, uh, so so if things are not panning out the way you expect, uh, and particularly you know I, I'd hark back to my job as a communicator. 
um, you, you, we've got some really smart uh, uh, men and women who, uh, who can actually uh, um, solve some of these problems through some of the most unconventional ways. Um, moving, moving on to your, uh, you, to your, your, your question about stress, uh, it's a, uh, you, I, I, would, uh, I would talk about the, uh, the, the, the four deployments I've done, uh, which have all been on average around about six, uh, six to uh, eight months. Mm. Uh, you, you, you live and you work with people. Um, uh, on a daily basis, uh, there, there's not much room to uh, uh, to, to get away from uh, from folks. No. Uh, so you know, not only have you got the stress of being at work uh, in a uh, in a in a highly dangerous situation in some circumstances, uh, but you've also got the uh, I guess the more mundane thing of uh, that the guy you're working with um, once you once you once you finish your shift, you both go back to the same room and you're uh, mm. and, and you're also. Uh, living with the same guy. Uh, and, and sometimes that's great. Other times, uh, you know, mm. it can cause a little bit of friction uh, and can be uh, a little bit of, uh, a little bit stressful. Uh, look, so, so for me, uh, as a, uh, you know, as a Lieutenant Colonel now, I, I, I rely on my subordinate commanders and, you know, it requires strong leadership uh, on their part to be able to manage those, uh, uh, you know, mm. manage the workloads uh, and also manage um, their, uh, their, their, their downtime as well um, because the, I guess what I found is that uh, yes uh, people need their downtime but it also needs to be a little bit structured um, so, so they don't uh, so they don't go rogue uh, or mm. they don't uh, they don't uh, uh, insulate themselves where they where they don't interact with anyone um, beyond the, uh, yeah. the the working hours because that can also be uh, uh, a sign of, uh, of, of of stress in itself where, uh, where where we found a couple of our folks, um, we, we just not interact. Uh, so, so you need to sort of engage them, keep engaging. Um, I, uh, so, so I guess in, in the deployments I've done, I've, uh, and, and in my day-to-day work, I find uh, exercise is a great stress, stress relief um, and, mm. uh, and being able to get out uh, before I hit the office uh, or after um, is, a, is a great opportunity just to, uh, just to relieve some of that, uh, that, that, that pent, up, uh, pent up stress. Um, yeah, it's... Yeah. Uh, other things as simple as uh, you know, for, for me, it was just going for a coffee with uh, uh, with my uh, so so within uh, within my organisation, I had a sergeant major who's my senior enlisted uh, soldier, mm. um, and it's just going taking him for a coffee and uh, and just being able to sit down, have a brew, uh, and and have that discussion. So I you know I found that uh, um, really good. But uh, what I would say also is, uh, you know, we, we we also had great opportunities uh, while we we're away. Uh, again, it's while you deployed, do you. you uh, invention is the mother of necessity, and uh, you, uh, um, you you form these groups. So we had an entertainment committee, uh, and the entertainment committee was responsible yes. for things like trivia nights. Uh, we also, uh, which which is fantastic, karaoke. Um, you, you 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 wouldn't uh, you wouldn't see uh, many of the other uh, folks on Australian Idol uh, winning Australian Idol, but uh, no. but uh, there was, it was not too bad. Um, and uh, we also had uh, what we call the Forces Entertainment Tour, which comes through uh, each of the theatres. And uh, I don't know whether. Uh, Anyone remembers back, uh, but 1999, we, uh, we were in uh, Dilly East Timor. We had uh, John Farnham, Kylie Minogue, uh, uh, the, the, the Living End Band, uh, and a couple of others. Uh, and I think Doc Neeson was there. And, uh, you know, that, 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 that's a great stress relief as well, to see a little bit of home uh, and yeah. uh, have that opportunity. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess the other, the other point I'd, uh, I'd just talk to you about is... Um, uh, not only on deployment, uh, that you, we've also got highly stressful jobs uh, uh, back here in Australia, and uh, and I think one of the ones I would uh, I'd, I'd specifically go to is uh, uh, for eighteen months I spent uh, some time uh, at uh, at uh, headquarters uh, forces command, which is located in Sydney at Victoria Barracks, uh, where I was employed as what we call the incident manager, uh, and. Uh, the incident manager mm. is, uh, is, is, as the name suggests, you, you're looking after you, you, you're looking after a number of uh, uh, um, difficult situations, uh, ho- uh, complex uh, issues that, uh, that 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 soldiers um, uh, and, and officers find themselves in, uh, and, uh, and and you just need to make sure that uh, the other uh, commanders and the uh, and, uh, and and of course the uh, the person uh, is 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 well supported through that process, but it exposes you to a. Uh, uh, to, to a side of, uh, of, of army that, uh, that not many people get an opportunity to see. Uh, and and no. again, I, I would say that uh, you, you remember that, uh, that, that the military is a cross-section of society. We, we come from all different uh, uh, 
places backgrounds um, and uh, and uh, and unfortunately at times so uh, some of those pasts might catch up uh, but uh, uh, mm. but uh, yeah and, and and I found that to be a uh, particularly challenging 18 months uh, because again it's a uh, unfortunately uh, uh, when, when, when again I go back to the name of the job incident manager you, you never you, mm. you're not really dealing with the good side of, uh, of, of no. uh, when people things you, you're dealing with the uh, the the, uh, the difficult side and yes. as I said, I found that a, a very challenging 18 months towards the end. And uh, um, for me, it was a, uh, uh, again, it was, uh, I had some uh, very good friends that I could talk to about the, uh, the situations that I, uh, uh, that, that I found myself uh, attending or, or, or doing. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was important for me as well. Yeah, so mate, in summary, uh, I think in an area of conflict, it can be just as challenging either side of the wire. But I think what you were saying is that um, inside the wire, it's important that you identify people, you, you make sure that people mix, that they, they uh, are continually talking to other people and not doing things on their own. So and that's again, just talk to your mates and, uh, and be involved. But uh, moving away from the Middle East, and um, I don't want to get uh, personal here, but you've got a family, you're a family man. So how do they cope? And, and does the military do anything there? Is there a military family uh, um, that looks after, you know, wives and children's and things like that yeah absolutely absolutely so uh, i'm married to vanessa and we've got two kids sophie who's 14 and uh, and isaac who's nine um yeah we um being being deployed uh was a uh, um was was interesting uh and uh you, you talked about the military family uh yeah we there is there is a i, I think there is a there is a, definitely a a family within uh, within the units you, you mm -hmm. join uh, but it's it's also important that you've uh, you've, you've got your own uh, family and uh, and you know my, Vanessa's folks and my folks have been a uh, a been a uh, an absolute support to us both uh, throughout mm -hmm. those very challenging times. Um, when I uh, when I deployed to West Timor in two thousand and six, it was a, it was about a week after Sophie was born. Um, oh, so yeah. needless to say, I wasn't particularly husband of the year um, of, in, in, in that year. Um, no. But uh, we. Um, uh, that that was a uh, that that was difficult. We um, uh, again we knew Sophie was coming, uh, and uh, but uh, unfortunately uh, the uh, uh, if if I can use the, uh, the the phrase duty called, and uh, I, I needed to uh, head off, and uh, uh, and mm. uh, we um, uh, mum and dad uh, supported us uh, extremely well throughout that period, um, and looking after Vanessa as, uh, as did Vanessa's folks as well, um, yeah. and uh, without them uh, it couldn't have been done. Um, more broadly. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, my, my my role as a uh, as a commanding officer uh, on my re most recent deployment was uh, uh, you, you know you, you can't make people talk to their families. Some people just uh, they're, they're either very terrible at uh, communicating, uh, they uh, mm. or they uh, uh, so so my role was to make sure that uh, we we at least send something out. Um, uh, so so I, uh, uh, I I wrote a uh, a quarterly newsletter um, just oh. to make sure that uh, we, we 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 sent. Uh, we sent messages home, uh, and uh, and at least the uh, the families were able to hear what their what their loved ones were doing while they were deployed as well. Um, yeah, that's great. You know, the the, mil the, uh, the military has great support mechanisms through uh, the defence community organisation, uh, and uh, uh, there, there's a number of different uh, uh, opportunities through there for families to engage uh, if if they're feeling hardship. But uh, yeah. but I think. Yeah, the, the the best thing that we could have done in terms of supporting families uh, was, yeah, certainly for me was uh, was the opportunity to uh, was to call home and uh, you know in the in, in today with today's technology, um, mm. it was being able to Skype, see the kids, uh, and uh, and and talk to uh, talk to Vanessa, uh, just to see how their day was going as well because uh, our, our days are uh, are very full um, and mm. uh, we we've, we've got a lot on our plates, uh, but. Uh, uh, important to note that uh, back here as well, life keeps going, and uh, and 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 there's, there's some really full days and challenging situations. Uh, yeah, back absolutely. Here. So, mate, we'll uh, now fly to uh, Washington, and um, can you just tell us about that? I, I could ask specific questions, but just um, your role there, and 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 drop some names if you like, uh, embellish it all you like, but um, just to me, I, I think that would have been a, a tremendous part of your career to work in the embassy in uh, Washington. Yeah, we were uh, um, we, we were really grateful to be uh, selected for the uh, for the opportunity to go and uh, and de deploy or not deploy, but uh, can, uh, do a posting to uh, to Washington DC. So in the uh, in the embassy, uh, they, they've got a military staff, which is uh, which is uh, uh, 
the same uh, through a number of embassies throughout the world. Uh, it, it varies in size, but Washington DC, uh, all the states, is our, is our largest presence overseas uh, within a, uh, a diplomatic uh, sense. Uh, and the military staff there are, are there to uh, obviously fly the flag and, uh, and conduct those liaison uh, with, our, with our really important uh, allies. Um, my role in the embassy was as the senior military communications officer. Uh, I, uh, uh, I provided advice to my boss, uh, who was the, the, the head of Australian Defence Staff, um, on, uh, on communications issues. Obviously, we need to uh, send, uh, we, we've got our own systems overseas that we, uh, that we need to talk back, uh, back here to uh, Canberra. Uh, but I also had the opportunity um, to, uh, as the, uh, what we call the, uh, uh, the uh, command and control uh, uh, liaison officer. Uh, so, so uh, interfacing with our with our partners, and it wasn't just the US. While I was there, um, the the US seems to be a, uh, a naturally, as you would expect, a uh, a bit of a concentration point uh, for, mm. uh, for for interaction. Um, so I uh, was the uh, the Australian liaison officer, looking after um, our interoperability um, uh, initiatives from a communications perspective, making sure that uh, you know if we if we if we go on operations with our partners, uh, and in particular what what we term as our Five Eye partners, so uh, Australia, New Zealand, UK, US, and Canada, uh, we, when we go on operations with them, that we can uh, be in some way interoperable, and our uh, and our systems uh, are able to work together. Um, so we uh, yeah, so so we spent three years in the states there. Uh, while I uh, while while I was there, the uh, initially we had uh, um, uh, Mr. Kim Beasley as the uh, as the, as the first uh, as the first ambassador there, uh, and I think he was there for about six months, and then he was replaced by uh, by Joe Hockey, uh, and that was uh, that was interesting. Obviously, Joe uh, comes with a uh, a bit of a uh, a larger than life personality, um, and uh, we'd seen him uh, uh, we'd seen him a number of times on TV, but uh, uh, to work in the embassy with him was fantastic. He's a uh, um, Joe, uh, Joe, Joe uh, was 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 all about the relationship uh, with uh, with the uh, the US, and uh, I'm fairly sure he uh, um, at one stage I heard that he that he'd gone out uh, um, sought out Greg Norman uh, for some golf lessons uh, to, the, to where he could then uh, go and match it up with the uh, the president uh, at the time on the golf course. So, any any other stories you could tell about Joe from a personal experience? Hey, look. Um, I, uh, I went through a very twitchy time, I think. Uh, uh, so uh, in 2010, I, uh, I attended the uh, Australian Command and Staff College, which is a year you get to spend here in Canberra, um, where uh, you, you, you uh, come back to, uh, with your peers to uh, attend. A, uh, it's like a, a higher uh, university, if you like, um, for, uh, for, for um, study and, uh, and ongoing uh, employment at the, uh, the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and above. Uh, during that year, you uh, you do play a um, a grudge match, uh, and uh, we had a um, so it's the uh, the staff college team, uh, which uh, which played the uh, the the Canberra Old Boys, uh, of which uh, Mr. Hockey was uh, was a uh, uh, was a member of the uh, of the uh, of the Old Boys team. Uh, now I won't say who because uh, it's protected identity, uh, but uh, but a uh, but a, a a member of our team uh, may have. Uh, uh, knocked Joe uh, out at one stage, and uh, and Joe was uh, was flat out on the ground, um, and uh, and uh, with a, with a bag of ice under his uh, under his under his head. And uh, there is video of this. If you uh, I only searched for it this morning. If you if you do look on YouTube, uh, uh, it is there. And uh, as I arrived in the embassy, in fact, as uh, as I heard, uh, Mr. Hockey was uh, named the next Australian ambassador. And as we uh, as we uh, we met. I, I, I often wondered, uh, would he remember uh, faces on that field that day and, uh, and seek retribution? And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, I, 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 either, either we concussed him enough that he didn't remember uh, or, uh, or he's let bygones be bygones. Well, poor old Joe's had a rough uh, time because I can tell a joke, a story too. And um, rumour has it that he and uh, former Prime Minister Tony Abbott went to university together and they did pay, play rugby union. And I think unbeknownst to uh, Joe at that time, Tony Abbott was a, uh, an amateur boxer and uh, Joe happened to take him on. And I think the former Prime, Min Prime Minister knocked him out again. So poor old Joe uh, <laughs> was copying it everywhere. Like we're getting close uh, to time. So what I, um, what I might do now is um, just the last question I would ask you, and then uh, we might open it up to see uh, 
uh, see whether there are questions from people listening, but um, major achievement for you. And I mean, uh, you know, uh, Lieutenant uh, Colonel is, is up there, I, I, I'm sure. But, it, you know, what, what is your major achievement uh, as far as through your eyes? Yeah, that's how you. That, that, that's a, that's a tough question to answer because again, as uh, as I said at the uh, the start, when you have the opportunity to reflect, uh, there there are so many good things that I've uh, been able to uh, to do in the military. It's a mm. uh, um, again, it's a uh, commanding at each rank level uh, is a uh, you know that's an achievement in itself. Uh, the types of jobs I've done where I've been a uh, you know for instance a, a, a signals officer within an aviation regiment and having the opportunity to uh, to uh, uh, head head away and fly uh, uh, fly uh, in the helicopters with the uh, with the, uh, the the pilots at the time. You know that that, that was also a uh, mm. a really good opportunity. Uh, but uh, you know I think the the opportunity to uh, um, uh, uh, to to take soldiers, sailors, and airmen uh, away on operations uh, and uh, and and work with them. I think that was mm. a uh, that, that that that's a, that's a bit of a a, a a jewel in the crown, if you like. Um, we uh, um, it's what we train for. Uh, it's uh, not everyone gets that opportunity to do that, um, and uh, I'm I'm very grateful for that opportunity to to have done that. Uh, and uh, I, you know, again, if you if you had asked uh, uh, Gunner Trappett uh, in 1993, would he be a uh, lieutenant colonel, having led yes. uh, soldiers, soldiers, sailors, and airmen on an operation? There was not a chance uh, that uh, that I ever would have predicted. I don't think anyone would have predicted that. Um, uh, but uh, you know that that's, that that for me has been a, uh, a, a an absolute highlight. Oh well, mate, I, I could I could see the potential way back when you were only a young snowy-headed kid, and and I uh, taught you with a an air rifle how to um, chase away uh, stray cats. But we won't go into that. But I could see the potential that you had then, mate. It might <laughs> be it might be classified information, but uh, you know what next for the lieutenant colonel? Yeah, it's a great question. I uh, again, it's a um, uh, you, you, you need to speak to my uh, to, to my uh, my <laughs> career manager, uh, but uh, yeah, I've got two. I've got uh, obviously the the military one, and then there's Vanessa as my career manager. Uh, but uh, look, you know, we, we've got the uh, we've got the kids in school, uh, and they're yes. uh, they're doing well. So so I think uh, a little bit of stability I owe to the family, uh, and uh, and just uh, making sure that uh, you know that they have the uh, the opportunities that uh, uh, that I also had, uh, and uh, yeah, so so I think. Uh, well, we'll see what happens. It's a, uh, I'm enjoying what I'm doing at the moment and uh, yeah. it certainly keeps me on my toes. Good work, mate. Look, stay online. We, we, yeah. we haven't got much more time and I know you're a busy man, but I might hand back to Georgia just to see whether there are any questions. And uh, so I'll hand back to you, Georgia, please. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Adrian. That was just so interesting. It is fascinating to, to get a peek into the lives um, of our military. Um, and, you know, we just take our hats off to you so incredible um, and fascinating to hear about. We've, we've got a couple of questions that um, some of our guests out there are wanting to ask you. Um, off the back of what you, you mentioned before about being a 15 year old, one of our um, people in the audience has said, given that you have a very long tradition of family involvement in the military, what would you say to that 15 year old Adrian Trapper before committing to a life in the military? Uh, yeah, that's a, uh, that, that's a, that's a great question. Hey, look, um, I've, uh, yeah, I, I would absolutely uh, highly recommend a, uh, an, a career in the military. It's a, uh, I've, I've enjoyed every single moment of it. And, uh, and, and again, you know, look, sorry, I, I, I should caveat that with, uh, you know, there, there are some days there where it's, uh, where it's tough uh, as, you're, uh, as you're humping and pack up a, a large hill. But uh, I, I found my career to be very rewarding. Um, and uh, if, I, if, I, if I knew then what I know now, um, I, again, it's a. Uh, I wouldn't change a thing. It's uh, the opportunities that we've uh, that we've had uh, have been absolutely fantastic. So I, I, I strongly recommend a, uh, a career in the military uh, if if if, uh, if anyone was ever thinking about it. There's so many opportunities, so many different jobs that you can do as either as a uh, as a, uh, uh, as, as a as a soldier, um, uh, or a sailor, or an airman. Uh, again, looking across the three services there, uh, and uh, and of course uh, an officer in each of those. So absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, uh, given Australia has a relatively small armed force compared with other countries, how do we integrate an operation with other nations or do we act separately? 
yeah, no, it's a uh, so so interoperability is a, is an absolute uh, key for us, um, and I don't think uh, uh, there's a um, in 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 the uh, the past twenty years that I've been in the military. Uh, so Australia uh, led uh, the uh, the the uh, the operation into East Timor twice. So in uh, two thousand and uh, sorry nineteen ninety nine, and and then again in two thousand and six. But uh, you know we we. Uh, uh, our, our cooperation and uh, and partnership with our with our other nations, and it's not just our other five I nations. Uh, you know, the United States, UK, Canada, and, the, and New Zealand, but it's also some of our uh, near region partners as well. Uh, and we are uh, we 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 are active uh, actively uh, working with the uh, the near region as well um, to uh, to ensure that we can uh, interoperate. Um, again, it's. Uh, Going, going to war or going on operations these days is a uh, is not a uh, proposition that we uh, that we would like to do alone. Um, it's it's always with our uh, with our with our partners. And and a question um, that I'm intrigued about: How do other countries handle the Australian humour? Do they do they get us? Do you, <laughs> it must be yeah. a big, big part of you know the stress management and. Yeah, no, absolutely. So it's a uh, so I found our time in the uh, in the United States uh, again. It was uh, it was interesting as we first got there. Um, it's a uh, some some of the Australian humour was uh, I wouldn't say it fell flat, but uh, the uh, but uh, certainly uh, some of my colleagues uh, found it difficult to grasp, uh, particularly with some of our language, uh, and, and also uh, it, it's our expressive language and also our um, uh, in the way in which we speak. And I had a uh, uh, I had a um, an incident at uh, at a Starbucks of all places, where I was trying to order five coffees, uh, and I uh, and I thought I'd uh, lay it out uh, very clearly for the uh, for for the young lady there, and uh, it was uh, I, I grabbed five coffees. Um, I, I want three of them to be uh, lattes and two to be uh, long blacks, and uh, and and uh, it eventually turned around. She said to her coworker, "I can't understand a word this guy is saying." It's a uh, um, and uh, I, I, I felt uh, I felt very alone at that point, but uh, but fortunately we managed to uh, break through the barrier, and I got my coffees. And uh, but uh, you know the, the humour is a uh, uh, it's a uh, it's it's a really interesting uh, um, piece for us to uh, to work through. But uh, no, by the end I think I brought them around, and they got they got it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Um, just one final question, Adrian. Uh, it goes without saying uh, that deployment impacts your family unit, as you've talked about already. Um, what measures do you take to keep tightly involved with with raising your children? Yeah. So the uh, uh, so so obviously when I'm uh, uh, when I'm when I'm at home, it's uh, it's taking those opportunities to uh, to. Uh, uh, head out to you know the the, the very important things like uh, um, first days at school. It might be uh, assemblies where they're where they're getting awards and those sorts of things. So it's taking those opportunities to actually get out and uh, and uh, and attend those things from work. And uh, you know the military certainly the uh, the workplaces and the bosses I've had have been uh, have been absolutely fantastic and always encourage that uh, for the families. Uh, uh, you know when you're on operations though that's a, it's a, it's a bit tougher and it's uh, for, for us uh, for Vanessa and I. Uh, what worked were, uh, you know, as uh, very regular phone calls, uh, and for me it was uh, it was about uh, lunchtime in the Middle East uh, on my re most recent deployment. Um, uh, it was it was lunchtime in the Middle East uh, to when it, it was uh, it was early evening here, and it's just about uh, seeing how the kids are going, seeing what help they need with school and those sorts of things. And uh, as I said, it's a uh, we, we've come a long way over the years from 1999, where the best we could do was a. Uh, uh, was was a uh, a quick phone call home um, to now where um, you've got any number of these sorts of applications such as Skype and uh, and those sorts of things where you can attend virtually um, as long as you've got the connection and the time um, you, you know it's a uh, it's it's a bit of an easier proposition. But what I would say is that um, you know not not everyone on on operations has access to this same uh, amount of technology. We've got uh, we've got um, uh, ships that sail uh, in the within the navy into the Middle East. Uh, and they they have a uh, again because of the uh, the size of the pipe that comes onto the uh, uh, onto the onto the uh, the ship itself um, it, it does limit the, the way in which they can communicate with families so they do it a bit you know, it might be a bit differently it might be uh, handwritten le handwritten letters uh, emails and the uh, and 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 again when where where time and uh, and the uh, uh, the uh, the communications permit uh, also Skype phone calls and those sorts of things. 
yeah, it's a, uh, and, and again, I think I, uh, again, when, when, when you move house so frequently, uh, you, you, you do unearth a, uh, a whole bunch of stuff that, uh, that gets put away on a shelf. And, and I think I, uh, unearthed a, uh, a whole bunch of letters that, uh, that I'd, uh, written way back in 1993 when I was describing my recruit training to mum and dad. And then, uh, and then again in 1999, uh, where I reflected on sitting in the, uh, in the, in the back of one of our communications, uh, vehicles, uh, on, uh, on, on, on the night of, uh, December the 31st, 1999, as we were waiting for it to click over to, uh, uh, okay. to, to the year 2000 and, and all the, the Y2K bug to, uh, to take a hold and, and again to, uh, to see how I expressed that at the time was, uh, was, was, was uh, a real blast from the past. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> well, that, that's, um, that's all we have for questions for now. Um, thank you so much, Adrian. That's, that's excellent. Paul, I'll hand back to you um, right. just to, to sign off. Yeah, thank you. Adrian, look, thanks very much for your time and for sharing that information so willingly. Uh, it is appreciated. But uh, look, more importantly, thank you to you and your colleagues, men and women, uh, for the work that you do that we don't know what you're doing and uh, keeping this country safe and, and allowing all of us to uh, sleep well at night. So well done, mate. Uh, we're very proud of you and what you've achieved. And again, thank you for your participation today and uh, hopefully we'll catch up in the not so distant future. No worries at all. Hey, look, thanks very much for, uh, for, for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you and uh, have a great day. Right, thanks, mate. And I'll just say to the other people listening that our next uh, presentation is on uh, the 25th of June. It'll be back to uh, Thursday and it'll be the, uh, the co-founders uh, talking about uh, AFAN. So what we're all about, what we offer and whatever. So uh, please tune into that. So uh, for me, over and out, thank you very much. Thank you.